Praise the Lord. Good morning, Well family. It is so good to have you here. And as always, uh, I just want to take the time to welcome you. And, you know, at the risk of, you know, getting tired of hearing this, you know, I can't tell you just how grateful I am and how much I love our family here at the Well. I am so appreciative of all of you. And I want you to know that you are so greatly loved here. We love you guys so much, and we are praying for you and just believing God for, for great things. I know that some of you are going, some, going through some difficult times, but know that you're loved and know that you're being prayed for. You know, before I pray, I want to uh, I I pray for someone specifically. Uh, some of you um, haven't seen um, our sister Jessica Scott DeMillo, Frank's wife. She's been very ill, and she's in a great deal of pain. And, you know, my heart is so heavy for her, especially this morning. I, I just woke up, and my heart was really aching for her. And I, I just want to I wanna lift her up specifically. And I want you to, if you can remember her in your prayers, remember her in your prayers. You know, it's, when you're in pain, I mean, a constant thing, it's, 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 a, hard, it's a hard thing to deal with. And so I want to pray for her and pray for all of us. And so if you'd stand with me today as we just bombard the throne of grace, asking God for his mercy and his healing upon her life and, and that God would meet with us in a very special way today. So let's pray today. Father, we, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are great and you are awesome. We thank you that, Lord, that you are the great physician. We thank you, God, that, Lord, we're modern science and medicine and doctors and Lord God that you can step in Lord and and do miraculous things as your word says what is not possible with men is possible with God and so we pray for your hand of healing upon our sister that you would minister to her that she would know God that she is loved by you so greatly God and that you have a plan and a purpose for her life God and so Lord if she's watching now Lord I pray infuse her with your spirit may your love and your grace embrace her so tightly that she knows God that you are with her and that she senses your presence in such a real way and so I pray minister to her as only you can and today I pray as we are gathered here and those who are watching online Lord I pray God that you would meet with us that you would speak to us that you would continue to bring about the change and the transformation and the renewal and the revival, Lord, in and through us that you desire to bring, Father. And so, Holy Spirit, fall afresh in this place, God. May we sense the wind of your Spirit in such a great way, Lord God, that we don't leave this place the same way that we have come. May we have a fresh encounter with Jesus today, Lord. Lord, we avail ourselves to you, and we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. You may be seated. It is so good, again, to, to be with you. Uh, today, we're going to wrap up our series, In God We Trust. Let me ask you guys, has God spoken to you? Anybody? If there's even one of you, has God met with you? Has God challenged you? I hope so. You know, I can't tell you, I have been challenged, and I have been convicted in a lot of ways through my own messages. You know, it's crazy how God does that, that you may not believe this or realize this, but God often deals with me first before he deals with you. He's convicting me about things and dealing with things in my own life, and so I pray that as God has met with me and challenged me and encouraged me and built my faith up, that he's doing the same for you. And so even though we're wrapping up this series, I pray that you would continue to reflect back on some of the things that God has spoken to you and ask God to continue to reveal himself to you in a very special way. Well, this morning I want to begin by reading a very powerful portion of Scripture in John chapter 1. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, the verses should be on the screen. John chapter 1, beginning in verses 1. And this is what it says. In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made, 
Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verses 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. I want you to notice how it says, when Jesus came into the world, when the Word became flesh, right, He came full of grace and full of truth. I'm going to be saying that throughout this message. Full of grace and full of truth. If there's anything we as followers of Jesus Christ need to be full of, we need to be full of grace and full of truth. Unfortunately, we're often full of something else. I'm not going to say what we're full of, but, you know, sometimes we're full of other things that we shouldn't be full of. You know, I think it's, it's safe to say, well, I'll start with me. I think it's safe to say that I don't get it right all the time. I don't get it right all the time. And I know it's safe to say that as a church and as a body of believers, we don't get it right all the time. You know, and, and, and today I've actually entitled my message, When Christians Don't Get It Right. When Christians Don't Get It Right, because let's be honest, we don't always get it right. Sometimes we miss things. Sometimes, you know, we're oblivious to things. You know what I mean? And we don't always get it right, but it's important that we do get it right. And so if you're online, and welcome to those of you who are watching online, but if you're online, you, uh, type this in the chat, I'm going to get it right. Type that in the chat. I'm going to get it right by the grace of God. Amen. You know, for years, our country has been known as a Christian nation, as many of you know. The founders of our Constitution, the founders of this country, the vast majority of them were Christians. And the country was based and founded upon uh, Judeo-Christian values, right? You know, God bless the USA and such. And so for years, this is something that we know. But unfortunately, today, for a growing number of Americans, they would not say that we're a Christian nation anymore. As a matter of fact, there's actually a growing number, and I, I read this, but there's a growing number of people that would actually identify as what people call post-Christians. Post-Christians. Let me bring you some context as to what that means. This isn't necessarily the same as somebody who's an agnostic, which an agnostic simply says, I know there's something, or maybe there's something, but I just don't know what there is, right? And nor is it the same as one who says they're an atheist. An atheist is one who we know just doesn't believe that there's a God. A post-Christian is someone who has had some connection with Christianity, okay? They might have been raised in the Christian home. Uh, they, maybe they were baptized as a baby. Uh, maybe they went to Christian schools as they were growing up. Um, maybe they have memories of going to church with their families on uh, Christmas Eve or Easter Sunday. But how many of you know that those things don't necessarily make you a Christian, right? Just like walking into McDonald's doesn't make you a Big Mac. You know what I mean? It, 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 you know, none of those things necessarily mean you're a Christian. A post-Christian is simply someone who has had some exposure to Christianity, who's had exposure to the church, but as an adult has made the decision to reject it, has made the decision not to, you know, follow through with what their family believes, you know. For a long time, as I said, Christianity was the belief that most Americans adhere to, which has always been a good thing. It's always been a good thing, but unfortunately today, it's shifted from being something that many see as a positive to something that's considered to be a threat by some people, and it's scary. In fact, just the term, and I'm educating you guys on some things and the worldviews and what's happening today, but just the term Christian doesn't necessarily mean what it meant to a lot of people years ago. It's, it's, a, it's a Christian term for sure. Christian simply means Christ-like, Christ-follower, but it, that term has changed. It doesn't necessarily mean what it used to mean, and this is why you'll hear me oftentimes refer to us as followers of Christ. Christ followers, because a lot of times that term Christian 
has a negative connotation with some people today, which is sad because it's a biblical term. But I was even reading how being an evangelical Christian is often interpreted interpreted by secular society to mean someone who's hateful, someone who's bigoted, someone who's judgmental, someone who's homophobic, someone who's hypocritical, and someone who's an extremist. That's what you hear in secular news today. That's what you read in the newspapers, right? The question I want to raise this morning and we're going to be talking about is this. How do we faithfully represent Jesus in a post-Christian culture? How do we represent, how are we going to bridge the gap? How are we going to reach people for Christ, especially in a post-Christian culture? If we're followers of Christ, how do we represent him in a way that honors God and dignifies people in a culture that's becoming more and more anti-God, more and more hostile to the values of who Jesus Christ is? I think, you know, we would agree that we're living in a divided time. How many of you would agree with me? The country is divided. I mean, big time. We're living in a divided time. And what a divided world needs is a united church. Can you say amen? What a divided world needs is a united church. A united church. And I said this last week, and I'll say it again this week. It doesn't matter who's who's in office. Democrat, Republican, Independent. Our mission as as Christ followers is the same. It never changes, and we need to keep that focus, right? And what is our mission? I would say our mission is the same as Jesus' mission. We were called to live in love with grace and truth. We are called to live in love with grace and truth. Let's say that together. We are called to live and love with grace and truth. Okay? John 1, 14, once again, let's look at it again. And it says, the word became flesh. Think about, what is your word Your word is the very expression of who you are. Jesus is the very expression of the Father. The word became flesh. He embodied everything that the Father was. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among among us. We have seen the glory, the glory of the one and the only Son who came from the Father, again, full of what? Say it aloud with me. He came Full of grace and truth. He was full of grace and he was full of truth. How many of you know somebody who's full of something? Don't tell me what it is. But you know they're full of something, right? But it's not Jesus. It's not grace or truth, right? Um, But in fact, you know, when I was reading this, I was like full. It just stood out to me. Full of grace and truth. You know, in the original Greek, which the New Testament was written in, the word full is actually translated pleris, which means to fill to the brim. It means abounding in. It means thoroughly and completely full. That's what it means. If you've ever seen a glass of water that is full to the very brim, to the very top, if you just tap the glass, what happens? It starts to spill over. It starts to spill over, right? Because it's so full, it begins to overflow well in like manner jesus is overflowing this is what the verse is teaching us he overflows with grace and truth he overflows and whenever anyone came in contact with him they were immediately impacted by this grace that was overflowing by this truth that overflowed as a matter of fact you can read in the gospels that when the people heard Jesus teach, even the religious leaders, when they heard Jesus teach, they took note that he didn't speak like anybody else, that his teaching was different, it was powerful, it was relevant. And they said, who is this man? Who is this guy who's, who's expounding truth in a way that we've never heard before, who's expounding the scriptures in a way that we've never seen before? Who is this guy? Because they recognized he was overflowing with grace and truth. I mean, you know, again, why does that matter? Why does it matter? Why am I emphasizing it? Why does it matter that he came full of grace and truth? It matters because grace saves people and truth 
frees people. Grace saves people and truth frees people. Again, if you're online and you're watching us, type that in the chat. Grace saves and truth frees. Grace saves and truth frees. Just as Jesus came again, I'm going to say it again, full of grace and truth, we as followers of Jesus need to be full of grace and truth, right? The problem that many of us have as Christ followers is we often live in one of two extremes. We live in one of two extremes. We live on the extreme side of truth or we live on the extreme side of just grace, right? Jesus didn't come just being full of one of these virtues, right? He came full of both grace and truth. You know, when there is not, and you really need to get this, and this is why I think that we get it wrong. And this is why I think the church sometimes gets it wrong. But when there is not a proper balance between these two virtues, grace and truth, when, when truth is not tempered with grace or grace is not tempered with truth, how many of you know it becomes problematic? It becomes a big problem. Let me give you an example. Take truth. I mean, is truth a good thing? Absolutely. Truth is great. Truth sets you free. Truth confronts issues head on. Truth exposes falsehoods. Truth exposes what's in the dark. Truth gets to the point. Truth is powerful. Truth is powerful. But if truth is not tempered with love and grace, as you see in some Christians, they can become hypercritical. They can become unsympathetic. They can become out of touch with the struggles that people have and tend to be judgmental and pharisaical. Pharisaical simply means the Pharisees were the religious leaders of Jesus' day, and they were very critical. They were pharisaical. And so I'm sure we all know people like this where everything is black or white. That's it. It's just black or white. There are no gray areas, super rigid, unyielding, unbending, self-righteous, and quick to judge. Quick to judge. They're like <clears throat> what I would call the Christian police, if there's such a thing. Or sin sniffers. You know what a sin sniffer is? They're always looking at the faults of everyone else except their own. They're always looking for issues, and they're quick to point the finger, not realizing how many of you know the rule of thumb here. When you're pointing a finger, what, what, what happens? There are three other fingers pointing back at you, right? But they're sin sniffers. You know, this reminds me of an incident with Jesus' disciples in Mark chapter 2, verses 23. It says, one Sabbath day, Jesus was walking through the, some grain fields, and his disciples began uh, breaking the, off the heads of grain to eat. They were hungry. They weren't, it was a Sabbath. They weren't doing anything wrong. But then the Pharisees, it says, said to Jesus, look, why are your disciples, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain? They weren't harvesting the grain. They were just picking some of the grain to eat it right? And so Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. And so the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Here the Pharisees, again, so legalistic, right? They're accusing Jesus of disciples of, of breaking the law, where Jesus pretty much responds by telling them that human needs has a priority and always supersedes religious ritual when it comes to the law of love. Right? And they didn't see that. The Old Testament law was never meant to be a burden. And I want, you to, I want you to really get that. You know, coming to church and hearing God's word and hearing God's truth, it's not intended to be a burden to you. It's intended to be a blessing to you. Right? But, you know, when we get so religiously uptight, we start in, enforcing and abusing some of these things where now it becomes a burden for people. And it's not, that's not what the law was given for. It was given not for punishment, for, but for protection. That's why the law was given. And the point is, this is what happens when the truth is not tempered by grace. You become legalistic. You become legalistic. The other side of this extreme is the abuse of grace, which is what I call sloppy agape. Agape is simply the Greek word for love, Right? But it becomes sloppy, right? That's the other extreme, the abuse of grace. You know, uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I thank God every day for his grace. Grace saves me. It is by grace I stand up here, you know, as flawed as I am. Grace is about God's goodness. It's not about God's justice. It's about God's goodness, right? But how many of you know if grace is not tempered with truth, it becomes loose and it becomes sloppy, 
right? That's what happens. Both of these extremes can be extremely problematic when they are not balanced and tempered by each other. This is why it says Jesus came full of both grace and truth, right? And I want to talk to you about that for just a moment, the problems that happen when um, we are not full of grace and truth. Again, if we're going to reach the world, if we're going to make a difference in the world, if we're going to make an impression upon the world, we have to get this right. We have to get this right, right? The first problem is truth without grace. If you're taking notes, you want to write this down. Truth without grace, it leads to rebellion. Truth without grace leads to rebellion. If we're just truth, truth, truth people with no understanding, no love, no grace, <clears throat> people not only reject, but they rebel against it. They rebel against it. I've actually seen this in many Christian homes where parents are so legalistic with their children. They're so legalistic with their kids. When the kids grow up and they become teenagers, what happens? They rebel hard against the rules that you've tried to shove down their throats. And I've seen this over and over and over again. You know, if you lead your family with rules without a relationship, that's truth without grace, I promise you it will lead your kids to rebelling against you. That's what will happen. Fact. This is why so many young people are turned off to God right now. It's crazy because of legalistic parents. Legalistic parents. Sadly, once they leave home, many of them will never come back to church. In some cases, become full-blown atheists. Why? <clears throat> Because their parents were too legalistic with them. As a matter of fact, in a statistic I read, it said that 86% of youth drop out of church after graduation, never to return. Wow. Why? Because of there's not that balance of grace and truth. Instead of parents teaching and modeling for their kids what it meant to be in a loving relationship with God and what it means to serve God, they acted more like the Christian police. Again, this is what truth without grace produces. And this is true in the house of God, as a family of God. If, if me, Pastor Darren, Pastor Steve, <clears throat> are just legalistic, are just constantly coming down on you, guess what? At some point, you're going to be like, I can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. So there needs to be that balance. There needs to be that balance. The other extreme is grace without truth, right? Grace without truth also leads to something that is not good. Grace without truth leads to relativism. It leads to relativism. Now, this is the attitude that equates grace to license. That equates grace to license. License to do whatever you want without any consequences because the idea that, you know what, it's by grace, man. Grace, 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 grace. I'm covered by grace. And so pretty much you're covered by grace. You can do whatever you want. Right? Grace without truth, it leads to relativism. Now, some of you are wondering, what exactly is relativism? Relativism is the belief that there is really no such thing as absolute truth. Let me poll you guys this morning. How many of you believe that there is absolute truth, or how many of you believe that truth is relative? And what I, what I mean by that is, let me see by a show of hands, how many of you believe that you define truth? If, if you believe that, raise your hand. How many of you believe there is an absolute truth? Raise your hand. Amen. Right? But there's a great, a growing number of people who believe that truth is relative. In other words, I define what is truth. Right? And that there's no such thing as absolute truth. Follow my line of thought here. If there's no such thing as absolute truth, then truth becomes a matter of opinion and personal preference. Right? And that's what happens when there's grace without truth. <clears throat> this is why you'll hear, hear people say things like this. You have your truth and I have my truth. Right? I've shared this with you before. I remember being at uh, Cal, uh, Cal State Long Beach and, and doing these surveys and talking to all the college kids and asking them this question. Do you believe that truth is relative or do you believe that truth is absolute? I'll tell you what. 80% of them said I believe truth is relative. Because that's what they're being taught. That's what their teachers are teaching them. 
And it's sad, but this is why you hear that. You have your truth and I have my truth. What's right for you may not be right for me. You do you and I do me. Your idea of right and wrong is not my idea of right and wrong. See, but that's not correct because there is absolute truth. There's absolute truth and there's absolute wrong. This is how people can rationalize when, when truth is relative, right? Let me tell you what happens. We rationalize and justify things that are clearly wrong, but because we define what we believe is right and wrong, what we believe is true, then you know what? You can pretty much do whatever you want to do, and that's dangerous. Have you ever considered how in this country alone, and I know I'm going to touch it. This is, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I know this is touchy, but in this country alone, we're able to justify, and this is not an exaggeration of numbers, millions of babies that are aborted every year. Millions. We, 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 we rationalize. And you know what? That it's legal to do it up to the third trimester. Do you guys know what that means? That means a baby can be aborted when the baby is fully formed. It's legal to do that. How do we rationalize that? How do we justify that? Well, because truth is relative. You see that? Or I don't know if you know this, but in Oregon, this just happened, you know, just a few months ago. Just recently, they decriminalized and legalized drugs. What, what kind of drugs? Not, we're not just talking about marijuana. We're talking about cocaine, heroin, oxycodone, uh, methamphetamines, psychedelic mushrooms, you name it. Acid, mescaline, whatever it is, they decriminalize that and it's legalized. And so you know what? You want to get high out of your head? Go to Oregon and you can do it because it's legal to do that there. How do we, how do we, how do we justify that? I mean, again, truth has become relative. Dangerous, man. We are living in some dangerous times. And if, we are, if we're not thinking correctly, we can easily fall prey to the lies of society. And so it's so important that you are exercising your senses and that you're asking God for discernment in these dark times that we are living in. Right? But when there is no absolute truth, you, can, you can't say to anyone, right, that's wrong. Because how many times have you said something like that and somebody will tell you, you can't tell me what's wrong because I define what is right and wrong for me. Oh, so I can just go and kill your, your mother and that would be okay? Again, there's so many things like that, but it's crazy. And so grace without truth, it leads one, you know, one to the conclusion that it doesn't really matter what you do because I define what is right and wrong for me. As long as I'm happy, as long as you're happy, it's all good. It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. It doesn't really matter what you do as long as you believe what you're doing is right because grace without truth is the idea that love and acceptance without any type of definitive standard is okay. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? I mean, this is serious stuff. And so how do we respond? You know, sadly, this is how a great many Christians respond. Unfortunately, What's really common, a common response among uh, uh, Christians, you know, let's call it the philosophy of getting a little Jesus. Getting a little Jesus. Getting a little religion, right? In other words, get small doses of Jesus just enough to make you feel better about yourself, right? Where you watch, you know, your little Instagram clip of your favorite preacher, a minute and 14 seconds, and if you like it, you give a little heart, a little tap of the heart right there. And if you really like it, you might even give a little amen with the praise hands. You guys know what I'm talking about? Put your praise hands up there. Just a little bit. Read the verse of the day of your Bible app. Not so much that God forbid it convicts you or transforms you, but just enough to make you feel better about yourself. Just give me a little Jesus. That's all I need. Just a little bit. Just a little verse of the day where you tell yourself a verse of the day will keep the devil away. Right? Just a little bit. You come to church every now and then when it's convenient for you, when you got nothing better to do, it's okay, I'll come, right? <clears throat> just a little religion, just enough to make you feel better about yourself, but not enough to make you different. Just give me a little Jesus. That's what people do. That's what's happened. See, when Jesus came, he came full of grace and truth, full of it. What's my point? The point is little doses of Jesus is not enough. 
Little doses of Jesus is not enough. We need to be full of his grace and full of his truth. And it needs to be in this measure and it needs to be in this order. You guys hearing me? It needs to be in this measure and it needs to be in this order. Full of grace and truth. Why? Because again, grace saves, truth sets free. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Why grace first? Why grace first? Because as followers of Jesus, we need to lead with grace and then proclaim truth. That's why, right? Jesus doesn't say to anybody, change your life, get your act together, and then follow me. That's not what he did when he called the disciples, right? He didn't, he didn't do that at all. He says, come. That's what he says. He bid them just to come. Come as you are, and I will change, and I will transform you, and I will give you new life. As a matter of fact, Isaiah 55, 1, examples of what I'm talking about. It says, the Lord says, all who are thirsty, come and drink. He doesn't say, all of you who are willing to get it together, come and follow me. He says, all of you who are thirsty, come and drink. Those of you who do not have money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and, and milk with, without money and without cost. Just come. He just invites them. Grace. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Just come as you are, right? Both of these verses are pictures and examples of grace. That's what grace does. This is where the church and Christians have often got it wrong and turned people off. Listen, instead of extending grace first, we convey if you behave and you believe, then you can belong. That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. In other words, if you clean up your act first and place your faith in Jesus, then you can be a part. That's not true. The gospel message is love, grace, and then truth. Right? Again, that is the order. We need to adjust our thinking and learn to lead with grace. We need to learn to lead with grace because we want our church to be a place. Listen to what I'm telling you guys. We want our church to be a place where people can feel loved and welcomed even before they believe. Even before they believe. A safe place for people to come even before they've gotten their act together because it's grace that saves people. It's grace that saves people. Now, th this doesn't mean that we condone sin, that it's, you know, we have no standards. Of course not. You know, the Apostle Paul actually addressed this very issue in the book of Romans chapter 6. He raises the question, and I want you to follow his progression here, but in chapter 6, verses 1, he said, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? He begins with ta the issue of grace. And then he moves to truth. Of course not. And then he moves back to grace. Since we have died to sin, how, do we, how did that happen? Due to what Jesus did on the cross for us, that's grace. Then he goes back to truth. How can we continue to live in it? In other words, the truth is if, if God has saved you from your sins, you won't continue to live in sin. The point is we lead with grace and we proclaim truth. And, and it's important that we understand that. The challenge with the truth to a post-Christian generation is post-Christians are often skeptical about truth. They're skeptical about truth. They would tell you that anyone who claims to know truth is arrogant at best and maybe even dangerous at worst, right? Here's what, you know, we have to understand. Truth is not intended to beat people up. And so many Christians do that, you know what I mean? I, gosh, you know, I get so grieved sometimes where I, I'll hear some pastors, and they're great teachers, but it seems like they get a kick, like they're almost excited to send people to hell. You're going to hell, you know what I mean? You see these guys, and it's just like beating people down. It's like, wow, you should be crying up there that people are going to hell. You should, you should be mourning in your heart and pleading with them to receive the grace of God. Not, not you know, pacing up and down the stage, you know, just throwing down lightning bolts. I mean, but yet you, you hear that, you see that, and it's, again, as a young believer, I used to think, oh, that's so cool, until I was the one that was getting beat up by the truth. You know what I mean? And it's just not fun. It's not, it's not what God wants us to be. It's not how God has called us to represent him. 
right? Truth is not restrictive. It's not repressive. It's not oppressive. Understand that. Truth is freeing. Truth is liberating. Truth is life-giving. Isn't that why you come to church? Because you want to be liberated. You want to be, you want life imparted to you. That's why you come. I hope that's why you come, right? As a matter of fact, we can see this all the way back in the book of Genesis, right? In the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam after he had created everything and, and just declared everything that he had created was very good, right? What did God tell Adam? I mean, isn't God a good God? He says, be fruitful and multiply. He, told, he tells Adam with his beautiful wife, you guys remember when he first saw, when he saw Eve, the Bible says she was naked all of a sudden. He says, whoa, man. That's where we came up with the word woman. He was so blown away. He was like, whoa, man. She's, you know what I mean? And then God says this to him. Hey, dude, enjoy it. Be fruitful. Multiply. He's like, thank you, Jesus. Right? He's like, he loved it, man. It was, it was awesome, right? So, you know, God, at first, he says, hey, man, he says, you know what? You could enjoy everything in the garden. Everything. Just stay away from the tree of knowledge. Just stay away from there because if you eat it, your eyes are going to be open, you'll lose your innocence, and it will eventually lead to spiritual and physical death. In other words, God's rule wasn't to limit their enjoyment, not at all. It was to protect them so that they could freely and fully enjoy all of God's creation, right? And so whenever God gives us a command or a rule, it's not to hurt us, it's to protect us so that we can fully enjoy all that God really has for us, right? God's truth is loving and freeing and life-changing. And we need to understand that. And so, man, we need to recognize, we need to lead with grace. And we need to ask God, God, continue to give me more of your grace so that when I, when I talk to people, man, they, that it spills over just as it did with Jesus. This brings us to why we extend grace and then truth. Truth isn't just rules, guys. Truth isn't just regulations. Truth isn't just morals. Truth is a person. Truth is a person. Truth is not just a what. How many of you know truth is a who? It's not just a what, it's a who. In John 14, 6, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Jesus also said in John 8, 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Grace saves, truth frees. And so when you think about the people with various issues, maybe someone who's struggling with addiction, we are to extend love and grace, you know, where they feel so loved and welcome here, even before they've accepted Christ, right? But never withholding the truth from them that if you continue in this addiction, guess what? It will kill you and destroy your life if you don't surrender it to God. But we lead with grace, and then we give them truth. I think of one guy who came through our doors, you know, and I'm not going to mention any names, but just loved him. Loved him. New family, new baby. Struggled with addiction. And just loved this guy so much. The church loved him. Um, and did everything. I remember even writing a letter to the court for him. Just that somehow that mercy would be extended to him. Uh, I remember baptizing him. And what a glorious day that was. And just seeing, you know, what was happening. Um, but unfortunately, uh, you know, he, he fell back into his addiction. And it just, it broke my heart. But you know what? We never stopped loving him and, and still love him and still, but at the same time, you know, give him the truth. You know what I mean? Still loving him in, in both grace and truth. All right? If you continue in this, you're, you're going to you're gonna wither away in your sin. And unfortunately, that's what's happened with this guy. You know what I mean? But we love him. And if he walked in here today, I would wrap my arms around him. You know what I mean? And, and love on him and give him God's grace, but not withhold the truth from him. Right? Grace and truth. Grace saves me and truth sets me free. You know, this past year has definitely been a very challenging season for many of you as it has been 
for me as well. And there's been so many times that I've, you know, just being candid with you, I've second-guessed my own spiritual leadership. I've been faced with my own inadequacies and my own shortcomings. And I question, how do I do this? I've, I've even come to Pastor Steve and, and Pastor Darren and, 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 and asked them, hey, guys, you know what? Maybe one of you guys need to be the lead pastor. You know what I mean? Maybe one of you guys need to, to be the senior pastor because, man, it's just been very hard. There's, there's a lot of things that you guys don't know that as pastors we deal with. There's the warfare that's intense. But you know what? God is so good. His grace continues to sustain me, and his word continues to speak to me over and over and over again. Grace and truth, grace and truth. And these are the verses that God continues to speak to me. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. I'm so thankful for God's grace and God's truth in my life that has sustained me. And it's so important that we recognize just as we need grace and truth every day, and that's what we need to be giving people, grace and truth, right? Who is Jesus? He is the word made flesh, flesh, full of grace and full of truth. His grace is a comfort to sinners. His love for the outcast, outcast is healing to the sick, is friendship to the prostitute, to the sinner. His truth, the chain-breaking, sin-shattering, intimacy-building, life-giving truth of God revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Right? What I've come to see, guys, in a postmodern generation isn't so much that people are rejecting Jesus. And I want you to hear what I'm going to say. It's not that they're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting a distorted view of who Jesus is from a church that hasn't always gotten it right. I don't care who people are, gay, whatever. They need, just, they need Jesus. I don't care. It doesn't matter. You know, we, we look at people and we judge them by the covers, not recognizing that sin is sin and that we're all sinners and we're all saved by grace and we all need to be transformed by God's truth. But you know what? Some of us, man, we, you know, we, we've, we've, we've gotten so cleaned up, we've forgotten what it is to be dirtied by sin, that we don't know how to, how to you know, we're, we're, we've become so sanctified, if you will, that Man, anytime somebody who comes in that doesn't look like us or doesn't sound like us and doesn't talk Christianese, we kind of like, oh, man, kind of just kind of back off. Man, but we need to extend grace to them and give them God's truth, right? And so from my heart to yours, those of you who are watching and those of you who are here, I want you to know that you are all greatly loved here. You are all welcomed here. We love you. The pastors and I, the leadership, we love you guys. And we want those of you who are watching who are, because I know that a lot of people do this. They'll come on and they'll watch online and they want to kind of just check us out. I just want you to know that we love you and you're welcomed here. Whatever you're facing, whatever questions, whatever doubts that you have, whatever your hurts are, whatever your baggage is, whatever your sin is, whatever your addiction is, you are loved and welcomed here. We love you. But you also need to know that you're also going to hear the truth here. And his name is Jesus. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. We're never going to water God's truth down. We're never going to water it down. But we're going to temper it with God's grace and God's love. Let's pray today. Father, today we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you'd help us to get it right to reflect the love of the one who gave it all for us. You know, as you're praying, as every head is bowed, wherever you are presently here or watching online, and you recognize, yes, 
You love Jesus. You want to honor him, but you haven't always gotten it right. And you want to look for opportunities to reflect his goodness, his grace, his truth in your everyday life. Ask God, God, help me, help us to be full of grace and truth. If that's your prayer and you're willing to pray that today, I want you to lift up your hand so I can pray for you. Fill us with grace and truth, God. Fill us with more of you. Amen. Father, I pray for all of us here and those that are, have their hands up. We pray that you would give us eyes to see people as you see them and a heart to love them as you love them. Welcoming people, showing your grace, just in the same way that Jesus did to those that religion rejected. Give us grace, God. And then the power of your spirit and your truth. Not just our opinions, but God, your truth that sets us free. Lord, continue to work in us and through us, Lord God. Continue to fill us with your spirit that we have a full measure of grace and truth in our lives. And so I pray this for your people. And as, you're, as you remain in an attitude of prayer, if I could just talk to those of you who may be watching or who may be here and you've never received Christ as your Savior, you know what? And you can do that right now. It's, it's nothing, you know what? It's simply just receiving Christ. That's it. And I would love to lead you in a prayer today. If you've never received Christ and you feel like, man, you know what? I need I need a full measure of God's grace. I've blown it. I'm not in a good way. I'm not in a, man, I, I've really messed up. I want to tell you, man, God has grace for you. And he wants to give you his truth that will liberate you, that will free you, that will transform your life. And so if that's you today, wherever you are, here, online, wherever you are, just say this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for the grace that you extend to me. Today, I receive your love and your grace, and I place my faith in you. Thank you for dying for my sins and rising from the dead. Thank you for loving me when, I'm, when I've been so unlovable. Today, I ask that you would take residence in my heart and in my life and that you would help me to live for you and to serve you as best as I can and as best as I know how and that I would grow in my understanding of your will and your purpose for my life. And so today I confess you as both Lord and Savior of my life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, I want you to know the Bible says that the angels in heaven are rejoicing. God has taken residence in your heart. And man, he's forgiven you of all your sins. The Bible says that everything has become new for those who are in Christ. Man, that, that is great news. And so I'll tell you what, if you said that prayer, write us. Get a hold of us. If you're here, come and talk to me or one of the pastors, and we'd love to pray with you and just give you a Bible if you need one or whatever it is that we can help you in your growth and walk with God. And so why don't we stand as we worship the Lord?